Welcome to Business Notes. I'm your host, Diane Bogino. Our guest today is David Wiener, known as Mr. Cashflow. David is the CEO of Cashflow Strategies, Inc., and he has been a consultant and coach to medical and dental practices, as well as small and medium-sized businesses for over 30 years. He is a nationally recognized expert in cash flow optimization, collections, engineering-based cost segregation, and has been a featured speaker for medical and dental conferences, as well as CPA conferences across the country. David Weiner, thank you so much for being on Business Notes today. My pleasure, Diane. Glad to be here. So, David, let's dig in and tell us how did your company Cashflow Strategies come about? <laughs> well, that's kind of a long involved story, but back in the 1980s, I worked as a practice administrator for a medical practice. And in 1989, I had also worked at a medical billing company. Uh, and so I knew a lot of doctors and dentists in the area who were constantly calling me for advice while I was running the practice. And so I decided in 1989 to go into consulting and do medical and dental consulting. And I did that um, in 2005, that, that was in Ohio, Northeast Ohio. In 2005, my wife and I finally decided we were sick and tired of snow. So, so we moved to the Metro Atlanta area. Uh, where I am now and absolutely love it. In, oh, probably 2003 or four, I started hearing from a lot of my clients that uh, doctors and dentists saying, you know, I I'm working as hard as I can possibly work. And I'm seeing as many patients as I can see, but I'm not making money anymore. What do I do? So when I dug into it a little bit, I realized their problem wasn't really revenue. They were making money. They just didn't have any money. And so the problem was really cash flow. And so uh, I decided to kind of focus my consulting on the cash flow area. And I began referring them to people that I knew that could help them with different services and things to help them improve their cash flow. But doctors being as busy as they are and not necessarily, I love them, but they're not the best business people in the world. Um, would never get a hold of these people that I was referring them to. So after a couple of years of frustration, decided, you know, they talk to me and they don't have a problem talking to me. So I took two years and vetted the best of the best companies that provide all the different services that those doctors needed to improve their cash flow. And I became those people, in essence. I signed independent contractor agreements with all of those companies. And so I can go in do an analysis, a quick analysis. I call it the cash flow checkup, just because I'm dealing with doctors and dentists um, of the cash flow in their practice, see where their vulnerable areas are, where they're having some problems with cash flow, and then whichever ones of those services make the most sense for them, if they choose, I can get them all set up with it and help them get started and watch the cash flow Im improve. So that's and so I named the company Cashflow Strategies because that's what I was giving them as Cashflow Strategies. Right. Yeah. Well, so what is the biggest challenge that you find that medical and dental practices have today? Well, <laughs> they have a lot of challenges, but one of the biggest things that I find consistently across all of them is um, their accounts receivable is probably the largest asset that they own. They have to collect from insurance companies. They have to collect from patients. And patient collection is getting harder and harder and harder every year because of high deductible health plans, because of low reimbursements now, because of the economy and a lot of other factors. And so uh, one of the, the main ideas that I can get across to them is you can't do your billing and collection the same way you did it 10, 15 years ago. Most of them are and it just doesn't work anymore. So we start with looking at their patient financial policy. Uh, I do a regular webinar on how to write a compliant and effective patient financial policy because you know, when you go into the doctor and they hand you that form that you're supposed to read and, and you sign it, 
that's their backup. That's the bedrock their practice can stand on as far as financial policy. And most of them either are using a very old one that's not compliant anymore, or they don't have one at all. Uh, and, and that just shocks me every time I hear that, that they don't have a written policy. Um, and then we begin looking at other ways that they can collect better from patients, how to collect more upfront, how to get paid faster uh, to avoid having to use collection. You know, collections in the U.S. overall is very expensive. Um, they charge generally 25 to 50 percent of whatever the balance is in order of whatever they collect. Uh, I am currently working with the largest collector of medical and dental debt in the world um, who doesn't work that way. They work on a fixed fee basis where, where the average cost to, to the doctor for their service is like $12, no matter what the balance is. And so I work with orthopedics. I work with a lot of oral surgeons and things who have balances that are gener patient balances that are generally in the hundreds. And instead of having to pay 30, 40, 50% of that to get it collected, they wind up paying $12. And they tend to like that. <laughs> and they get paid a lot faster too. So that's one of the areas that we work in. Um, and and uh, I, still, I still get involved in general practice consulting. I, I stay away from the, the clinical end, but the, the business end of the practice that's that's where I live and help them with patient flow and some of the other stuff if they need it. If not, we just work on cash flow. HIPAA compliance is also a big, big problem in medical and dental practices now. They're all required to be HIPAA compliant and some of them just hope for the best and, and hope they don't get audited. Well, <laughs> they're getting audited and they're getting audited more and more and more. And I've seen practices who spend $1,000 to get a HIPAA risk assessment, which they're required to have every year, when I can come in and do a HIPAA risk assessment for them for free. So, well, you know, David, that's one of the things I wanted to point out to our viewers is I printed this out so I wouldn't forget it. You have gone the extra mile and gotten three certifications, one from HIPAA, uh, one from the National uh, Business Member Sponsor and one from the Oral Surgeon Association. Uh, how do those allow you to help your clients better? Well, I have actually uh, managed the partnership between TSI, which is the collection agency, and the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. And I've spoken at their conferences. I speak at their conferences every year. That was the the one I missed this year in San Antonio, um, uh, did it from behind my desk. Next year, hopefully we, we get live. Um, and so I've gotten to know the oral surgery practice very, very well. And there are some very specific challenges that they have in oral surgery. They have to file both medical and dental insurance. They don't get a lot of repeat patients, although when they say, well, we don't have to worry about repeat patients you get family referrals, you get all kinds of stuff that are very, very important. And so I'm also partnering up with some other providers that do insurance billing. So if they need help with that, I, I can refer them to the right people if they need marketing and websites and all those kinds of things. I don't do those myself, but I can get them set up with the right person. I also speak regularly to the American or the Academy of Dental CPAs so those are CPAs who specialize in the dental world. And so a lot of my dental clients come to me looking for help with their, with their taxes and that sort of thing. And I can refer them to an, a dental certified CPA, which is a really, really good idea for them. Mm -hmm. And so, so how, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's, that's fine. Okay. How else do you help, uh, help your clients with their collections? Um, the collections, we work on the fixed fee collections. Some of the other ways that I help clients other than collections, um, one of the things that I've really seen an increase in lately because of the way the tax laws are changing is in engineering-based cost segregation. Um, I can help them save incredible amounts of money on their taxes if they own commercial or investment property. A lot of my doctors own their building where their practice is. Uh, dentists as well. Uh, I just had a, a local dentist here who called me because he bought a 
Wells Fargo bank branch and converted it into his dental office. It's the only dental office I've ever seen that has an ATM built right into the wall. I think that's really, really cool. Um, and I said, get your patients to pay in cash. They can take the money out of the ATM. <laughs> so we're speeding up his cash flow that way. Um, doesn't happen very often, but it's a good idea. Um, there is an alternative way of depreciating your commercial and investment property where instead of, if you own a commercial building, let's say the bank branch that he bought and converted into his dental office, normally that's depreciated over 39 years. By doing a cost segregation study, what they do is they come in, take a look at the building and break it into all of its component parts, a lot of which all the non-structural parts can be depreciated at five, seven, and 15 years instead of 39 years. With the current tax laws the way they are, all of that short life property can be depreciated 100% the first year. And so if you increase somebody's depreciation expense, very obviously you, you reduce their taxes, gives them a whole lot of extra cash flow that they can do for all kinds of other things that they need to do. Now that doesn't just work for doctors and dentists, that works for anybody who owns commercial or rental residential property. And it's a great, it's at this point with the way the tax laws are, it's a no brainer, it really is. I had a guy uh, whose CPA actually came to me here in town and he was building a warehouse. He owns some furniture stores and he was building a warehouse just to house his furniture. And his CPA said to me, do you think it's worth doing a cost segregation study on his new warehouse? Because it's just a warehouse. I don't know what we'd be able to get out of it. Well, I can run a free preliminary analysis for anybody, any building to let them know what a, what a study would cost and then what the potential tax benefit is. Typically those analyses are really close as far as tax benefit. The analysis for this guy said, uh, the study would cost him $15,000 but we were gonna get him uh, $1.1 million of additional deductions for his taxes. So his CPA said, okay, okay, yeah, we definitely wanna do that. <laughs> well, by the time we finished the study, the, the study was still $15,000, but we got him $2.3 million worth of additional deductions on his building. Now, he's a very happy camper, I think. Um, that's not typical. We don't usually see, one, we don't usually see the study be the analysis, initial analysis being that far off. And we don't always see that big of a deduction, but it's all based on the, on the size of the building. And if you own a small building, getting an additional 20, 30, $50,000 off of your taxes is still a pretty good thing. I don't know anybody who doesn't want that. <laughs> so that's been very, very popular knowing the way the tax laws are right now and knowing that they could change at any time. Um, that's very popular. And that's been a large part of what I've been doing recently uh, and speaking and teaching CPA groups on that because it's a topic that they're not all that familiar with. In fact, on my YouTube channel, I just put out a video that is six myths about cost segregation that might cost you money. So um, the myths are, are abundant out there and people don't totally understand it. And so one of the things with doctors too, if they use the building they own for their own practice and they do it in the first year, they can elect to combine the two entities for tax purposes and, and all that extra deduction can go against the profits from his practice. And so he can say, and, and there are a lot of CPAs that aren't even aware it's, it's the uh, elective group, the grouping election through the IRS and I've sent out a lot of IRS documents to CPAs and tax attorneys to show them that it's real and you can actually do it. <laughs> I agree. Uh, well, speaking of some of your programs, what topics do you speak to businesses on and to CPAs as well? I speak on cash flow in general. Um, I have one talk called Keep the Cash Flowing, and it's just about all kinds of different ways they might not have thought about to improve their cash flow by increasing their revenue, by collecting more faster, by cutting expenses, by saving taxes. And, and compliance is a big issue, especially with doctors and dentists. And they don't think of that as a cash flow issue, but it is because if they're not compliant, 
it's going to cost them big time if they're audited. So that's that falls into the cash flow uh, bailiwick as well. I speak on improving collections. Anybody who sends statements out or you know allows their their customers to pay over time probably needs to do something to tune up their collections and collect more money faster because the longer they wait, the, the value of those accounts depreciate. In fact, once an account hits 90 days, it depreciates a half a percent per day. And that's, I mean, that's a huge leak in the dike there, you know, and, and money's just kind of pouring out of their accounts receivable and they don't realize it. And so getting the money collected faster is a huge, let alone not having to pay the percentages, getting it collected faster is a huge thing for them and will, will actually greatly improve their bottom line. So we talk about increased collections. I talk a lot about um, to CPA groups and commercial real estate groups and things like that. We talk about cost segregation and the 2014 repair regulations. We're getting into the weeds with taxes now, but, um, and also the IRS real estate professional designation. It, it makes a big di difference whether you or not you, if you own, own some commercial or, or residential property, if you can qualify as a real estate professional with the IRS, it changes how you can apply all of the deductions that are, but it's very, very difficult to qualify. And unfortunately, most just kind of guess and say, well, I do a lot of real estate. I guess I'm a real estate professional. And then the IRS can come and get you. Mm -hmm. uh, and in tax court, 299 out of 300 cases regarding the real estate tax profession or real estate professional designation, the IRS overturned the case and won. Mm -hmm. not, not a good idea. No. But you want to be <laughs> very sure you're applying it correctly to the right people. And so I, I, I taught at the Georgia Society of CPAs real estate conference this year on how to use the real estate professional designation, how to apply it, how to know for sure who qualifies, who doesn't qualify. Um, and so I enjoy doing that. Um, my dad was a CPA. And so I grew up speaking their language and, and that sort of thing. And I, I enjoy working with the CPAs. So, yeah. You know, I watched one of your videos and I, this is going to be a dumb question, but it, it almost sounded like you thought cash flow was more important than profits. Would that be true? Well, it isn't necessarily more important than profits, but it's equally as important as profits. And people say, my, my business is profitable and you can have a perfectly profitable business and go out of business because you can't make payroll. And so that's what was happening to a lot of these medical practices that I started working with. They, they were making lots of money. The practice was profitable. They just didn't have any kind of controls on their cash to know when they were going to have cash, when they weren't going to have cash, and how much cash was going to be available. And so when I started to teach them about cash flow, the, you know, the light bulb goes on above their head and they say, wow, yeah, that's right. Talking about fixed fee collections and talking about doctors. I was talking to a doctor one day and he said, well, I'm not going to change collection agencies because I don't pay hardly anything to my collection agency. And I said, um, you're working with a, a percentage-based collection agency, right? And he said, yeah, but I don't pay them anything. And I said, Doc, the reason that you're not paying them anything is because they're not collecting anything. If they were collecting, you would be paying them your percentage. And he said, yeah, but it doesn't cost me hardly anything. <laughs> and so I said, I said, Doc, listen to me. The cost of your collections is actually the amount of money you're not collecting. And he, his eyes got wide and he thought about it for a second and he said, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of misinformation and, and people looking at things kind of the wrong way. And so I like coming in and showing them what's real and how it really works. I had one practice administrator. I was speaking at a large national conference and I was talking about maximizing collections in the medical office. And I, I made an offhanded statement that um, some unscrupulous collection agencies will tell you that you can just add their fee on top of the balance so that in effect, your collections cost you nothing. Well, 
the the math doesn't work <laughs> and it's illegal <laughs> the united states government considers that to be usury or charging an illegally high interest rate and you can get in terrible i saw a medical clinic that was fined in the millions of dollars for for the fact that they were doing that and when i said that and it was just kind of an offhanded comment that i was making uh, a practice administrator shot out of her seat and said wait a minute, you're telling me I can't add the, the percentage back on top of the bill? And I said, absolutely, you cannot. Even if, it's in the, even if it's in your patient financial policy, you can't do it. And she said, but my collection agency told me I had to do that. In fact, I had to contact my software company to get me special reports adding on that amount so that I would know how much to turn over to the collection agency. And in the back, if she sees this, she'll know. In the back of my mind, I was thinking that's not possible. So I said, after the conference, we need to get together. So we met in her office and I said, who told you that? And she said, they, they put it in writing. They emailed me that I had to do that. And I said, I'm sorry, but that just doesn't sound right. And she pulled out the email and they actually had done that. Mm. Well, that was the last day that she worked with that collection agency. <laughs> you think? <laughs> and has been a good client of mine ever since. <laughs> Great. David, do you recommend that small business owners have a savings account, a business savings account? Not necessarily. They need to keep a reserve, but it's kind of hard for accounting purposes to have a savings account. Now, if you can't keep a, a balance in your checking account, Sure, move it over into a savings account. <laughs> uh, but my, I had one for a long time when I started the business and my CPA smacked my hand and said, you need to get rid of that and just keep the balance in your checking account. It's much easier to account for. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a separate account. And for some people who, who tend to spend whatever's in their checking account, yeah, it's good to have, it's good to have a cushion somewhere. You've got to have a cushion in case of emergencies or if you want to make capital improvements or whatever. Um, I personally, I do it in my business checking account. Um, some people would use a savings account. Mm -hmm. The one thing I would always caution small business people on is do not use the same account for your personal and your business. Very small business people or entrepreneurs tend to commingle things like that and it is a nightmare to try and untangle all of that should the IRS come a call in or just to know how your business is doing. Uh, you've got to keep separate accounts, keep them absolutely separate, pay yourself a salary, don't just withdraw money in and out of the account, that sort of thing. And your CPA will like you a whole lot more that way. <laughs> The same goes for credit cards as well, right? You need to keep business credit cards and Absolutely. personal credit cards separate. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. you know, for the small business, um, you need to pay that credit card off every month. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't afford to be carrying a balance and paying interest. Talk about cash flow going out the window. Uh, the, the amount of interest that you would pay on that credit card, that credit card needs to be, it's great. Get your travel miles, get, get all those kinds of things. In my, my own personal business, every expenditure is made through my credit card. I mean, other than payroll and that sort of thing. But every expenditure is made through my credit card. And I pay that credit card without fail every month to zero. Never have an interest charge. Lots of travel miles, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So wrapping up, David, tell our viewers about your live stream program and what that's all about. Well, I started the YouTube channel and have had so much fun doing uh, doing YouTube videos, five minute, six minute videos on all kinds of business topics. I actually started out with a blog that I still do called Mr. Cashflow's Tips and Tricks. By the way, Mr. Cashflow is a nickname that was given to me by one of my medical clients here in Atlanta, uh, a large ophthalmology group. And I happened to walk in to do some employee training one day and the CEO of the group was standing in the lobby and just offhandedly over his shoulder said, Hey, there's Mr. Cashflow. And I said, Ooh, can I, can I use that? And he said, do I get a commission? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> and he said, no, oh, okay, you can use it. You can use it. <laughs> and so I've used that ever since. And I started the blog, Mr. Cashflow's tips and tricks. Um, I guess that wasn't enough work for me. So I decided to start doing YouTube videos as well. And then 
uh, in studying YouTube and that sort of thing, a lot of people told me I needed to do a regular blog, uh, a, a regular um, podcast. And I, I said, well, you know, I love video. I like doing video. So I think I'm going to do a live stream on a regular basis, invite people to come in just like kind of like you do, uh, who, who can talk on topics that will help. And so I started Mr. Cashflow Live and uh, have done a couple and plan on doing a lot more this year. But it's a lot of fun because I, I like interviewing people. I like talking to people and I like you know, I can't do everything. I would love to be able to do everything myself. But there are some people out there that just absolutely know things that I will never understand fully that can really be of benefit to my clients. And so um, just uh, a short while ago, I brought in an expert on the Georgia retraining tax credit, which is only available to Georgia businesses, but can get them tremendous tax credits on any kind of retraining that they do uh, and so he laid that all out for them. Hopefully it's going to get him some business, uh, but save a lot of people a whole lot of money. And so we've got a whole bunch of them lined up for this year. And I'm really, really looking forward to them. Great, great. So how do you prefer people get in touch with you, Dave? Oh, they can get in touch with me all different kinds of ways. They can, <laughs> they can get to me through LinkedIn or Facebook. They can get to me by email, by through my YouTube channel, but I prefer just a phone call. Uh, they can get in touch with me by phone. If I can't answer, uh, I am a little bit obsessive compulsive about returning phone calls. And so I will generally get back to them the same day, if not the very next day. Uh, or my, my brain keeps me awake at night because I didn't return phone calls. So, <laughs> but if they have any questions, my consultations are always free. So if, if you're a small business person, who wants to see if there are ways that you can improve your cash flow? Over 60% of small business people last year said the one thing that keeps them awake at night is their cash flow. So if, if you want to find out if there are ways to, to help your cash flow, I'll be happy to do a cash flow checkup and my consultation is free. You'll never pay me anything. I mean, unless I do coaching with you or write your financial policy or do something. Uh, other than that, um, I'm, I'm happy to help. It's what I do. My wife asks me, are you ever going to retire? Cause I turned 65 this year. Um, no, I'm never going to retire. I love what I do. Why would I ever retire? I get to make money, smile and walk away. And everybody <laughs> likes to see me coming. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know what I would do if I wasn't doing this. So I'm happy doing this. Great. Well, you have certainly opened a lot of eyes. I'm sure anybody that sees this interview, David, and I so appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you. I appreciate it very much as well. And I hope, I hope it does help some folks. I'm sure it will. Thanks. Thank you for watching Business Notes. We've been speaking with David Weiner, known as Mr. Cashflow. David is also the CEO of Cashflow Strategies, Inc. I'm your host, Diane Bogino, bringing you business ideas you can bank on.